in my first book, what I was struck by was the difference between the way we know something and how we feel about what we know. And a, and a good example was the, the very first um, thing that sort of started me thinking about this was they did a study on the Challenger study. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but basically they took 120 plus kids who were in college and they, it was the morning the Challenger shuttle, shuttle blew up. They took them two and, a half month, two and a half hours later and then they said, write a journal, describe exactly what you saw in vivid detail. So the people all wrote what they did at that very moment in vivid detail. And then the guy called them back two and a half years later and lo and behold, 25% got it even approximately correct and only 10% got it completely correct. Well, we sort of understand that memory changes over time, so it wasn't particularly surprising. But what struck me was that one uh, student wrote to, in, in, in the article, he said, that's my handwriting, referring to his journal, but that's not what happened. And I thought, well, he's got to know that what he wrote two and a half hours after the accident is more likely than something two and a half years after the accident to be correct. So he cognitively knows a, that, but he feels B. So I thought, well, what's happened in the interval? And so that led me to think about how the brain works. And so this has led to me for my work over the last 10 or 15 years, which maybe I've, I explained in a few sentences, is I thought, well, what is it? And we, we see all these conditions in neurology where people have a sense of something cognitively dissonant from what they feel. So they feel something, a, a good example is somebody dies. Now you know they're dead, but you still feel they're alive. I mean, you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you're going to phone them. Now you know that that's ridiculous, but you can't get the feeling out of your mind that they're alive. So you, I mean, that's a pretty simple example, but there are loads of them. From, and it occurred to me that there's something called involuntary mental sensations, and I don't like the word, but it's maybe the best one I can come up with. Namely, your brain makes some sort of unconscious calculation, and then it sends up into your consciousness some feeling tone about it so for example if I've never met you before I don't know who you are so my I see your face no pattern recognition now the next time I see you it'll I'll say well that's an 80 percent chance that you or maybe 40 percent chance depending on what you're wearing and your hair color this that and follow me and so at some critical point you'll have not only pattern recognition which is what the unconscious brain does but you'll have a feeling that emanates out of involuntary mechanisms that tells you the value of the computation. Those it tells you the likelihood. So when you recognize somebody, although you feel like, oh, let me see, that's, oh yeah, no, you, that's done unconsciously and then this feeling arises. So it occurred to me, it, there, there are a lot of states like that and they include familiarity, sense of agency, how we determine causation, how we even think about our body. Well, once you start adding them all together, you get to a peculiar point where you say, what do we experience as a mind? Okay, we have a very small amount of short-term memory. We can remember a phone number. We can remember four or five chunks of information. That's it. That's all we can carry on consciously. The rest of it's done unconsciously, then brought back up into consciousness along with feeling tones generated in the unconscious. Um, but what it's led me to think about is, the obvious question is, who's a per what is a person? What is a self? What is a mind? And I thought, well, who's studying this? And it's the mind made primarily out of a very small amount of short-term memory that only lasts for a minute or two, that small amount of information, emotions, and these involuntary sensations, they collectively are your experience of a self. And we now know from uh, uh, neuro neuroscience studies on sense of self is, can be changed. If you stimulate areas of the brain, you can get an out-of-body experience, for example. You can, if you take a monkey and you put an electrode in an area of his brain, so it says, my hand is right here, so you see the cells will fire whenever the monkey gets his hand approaches a peanut, let's say. Now you give the monkey a rake, and the rake's out here, and now you'll find after a week or so that the cells that for the sort of body representation of the monkey fire when the peanut's at the edge of the rake. Now you think about that in terms of our smartphones, PDAs, and all the rest of it, and you go, well, what, how, 
where does our self end and where does the external world arise? But the curious thing is we do have a body image of ourself which gives us a sense of a unique embodied condition, we'll call it, for lack of a better word. In other words, you exist in proportion to the neural ma maps and neural networks that you have that will be altered by your environment. So a rake will do it, PDA will do it. If you follow me, if you hold a baseball bat, after a while the end of the baseball bat will be part of your body schema. Okay. And there was an interesting study I read which kind of got me thinking. It's a woman who had a small stroke that left her without a sense of her left arm and leg as being hers. So it took away her sense of ownership of this side of her body. But her wedding ring had been on there for so long that it had been incorporated into the body schema so that when she looked at the wedding ring on her left hand, she did not recognize it. But if you took the ring out for her left hand and put it in her right hand, which was unaffected, she said, that's my wedding ring. So what it told you is that she lost the sense of ownership of it in this place, left hand, present in the right hand. Now, if you think about that, then you say, okay, we have an ownership of body parts. We have a sense of a unique self embodied in your representational map of how far you are, if you think about the monkey. And then you think, well, what is the mind? And we have a sense of ownership of a mind in the same way we have a sense of ownership of our body parts. And we have a sense of our thoughts being ours. So I was, uh, uh, we have a sense of agency, causation, all, these all of these are involuntary sensations. They are not, they are ge brain generated. They give us our perspective on the world. So you say, what do I think is missing in neuroscience? Well, you, the study of neuroscience is done by people who, including myself, who are thinking about the mind and the brain and judging the accuracy of their decisions by involuntary sensations over which they have no control. So here this weekend you have all these various people talking, including me, so I'm not, I'm not excluding myself from this, who have these notions, that's my idea. That I, I, that I have a unique mind that's embodied in a person that has unique thoughts, and not only that, because I have a very strong sense of agency, which we can go into more times, we'll go to in some detail in my book, we have a sense of agency which says, if I have thoughts that are mine, and they have agency, thoughts create other thoughts. And therefore we believe in our lines of reasoning as being our lines of reasoning. How much of this is true, which is what you were asking, versus how much of this is illusions, and I don't, I don't use the words as a pejorative illusions, but um, sensations that are beyond our control that look like they're within our control. and. Uh, once you think of the mind in that way, you realize, okay, the mind is a small amount of working memory for a short period of time. It's your emotions and these feelings that, that color all of your decision-making. That's what we're using to study the mind. And that's what we're using to create our philosophies. And on the other hand, it's, you can start to think in terms of how it might affect the way we think. For example, if you feel impersonally embodied, but a distance between you and other people, now you have a sense of alienation. You have a sense of uh, existentialism, if you follow me. So I think that a lot of the uh, future of thinking about the relationship with the brain and the mind will be in how these sensations really affect and are part and parcel of our sort of lines of reasoning.